everyone. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper. Rosanna Panzino is an award winning YouTube star, baker, entrepreneur, and New York Times bestselling author who's made a fun na a name creating fun food creations. Her latest book, Baking All Year Round, has 86 recipes covering holidays and special occasions. It's the perfect cookbook for families to make fun food together and create lasting memories. Please help me welcome Rosanna Panzino. Thank you for having me. I started laughing during that because you started laughing and I was just like, she's so fun. I'm so excited to have this talk. I get embarrassed really easily. <laughs> How is that possible? I don't know. It just happened. So I end up giggling or blushing. So I didn't even need to wear blush today. I don't wear blush whenever I'm talking with someone because I always end up getting embarrassed. I love that. After all the YouTube videos you've made, you still get a little nervous. I do. That's so that's so cute and awesome. So let's talk about the book. This is your second cookbook. Yes. And so let's talk about just how much work it goes into making your second book. Is it harder, easier than the first one? I think I thought it would be easier because the first time you do something, there's always so many learning curves. You're doing it for the first time. You're making a lot of mistakes. So I thought that I had figured it out. And by the time I would make my second book, that it would be easier. It was not because I wanted to make it as special and like have all the attentions to detail and as heartfelt. I put my heart and soul into my first book. So I wanted my second book to match that energy and that quality. And so... I really went a little overboard. I, I, I dove in deep with this book. And uh, this book has twice the recipes as my first book, so I <laughs> definitely wasn't easier. I, it ended up being more work, but it was a real labor of love. So I'm even more proud of it than the first book. And how is it different than the first book? Is it different tones, or is it that it's focused on these different celebrations? Different types of recipes. The first book was a bunch of geeky-themed treats, so it was a bunch of recipes that were inspired by all of the geeky things that I loved growing up. But this book has recipes literally for any occasion all year round. It's all of the holidays that I celebrated growing up. And then there's a chapter called Special Occasions. Actually, should be four chapters. There's so many recipes in there. Um, <laughs> but it's for birthdays, baby showers, engagements, weddings, uh, graduation, like school celebrations. So any type of event or occasion that you have going on during the year, hopefully this book has got you covered. It's got a little bit of everything. And something that's different about this book than the first book is I really listened to the feedback of my community. And they said, what about recipes that are dairy-free, gluten-free? What if we have food allergies? What about some vegan recipes? And even though I don't eat those things on a regular basis, even my own family members, like my sister, she can't have dairy. She's lactose intolerant. So I really took that into consideration when I was developing recipes for this book. So you'll see sprinkled in through this book, gluten-free, dairy-free, and vegan recipes. So that's the first time that I ever developed recipes like those because I am so picky when it comes to food. It needs to taste amazing. And for someone who eats sweets all day, if it's not amazing, why even bother? So if I'm going to make a gluten-free recipe, it has to taste phenomenal. And I think that's what really took so much time about this book is development. Recipe development takes, for all the recipes in this book, took a little bit over a year to develop all the recipes. And that means coming up with the recipes, some of them were made from scratch, just playing around in my kitchen and testing. I basically, if you ever wanna know what a baker does, it's like you're a food scientist. You're, you're just at a table or in your kitchen or at your workstation and you're testing the same recipe over and over again, switching the ingredients a little bit, looking like a little mad scientist, like more salt, more baking powder. Let's see what happens if we reduce the sugar a little bit and, and then just, eating cookies all day, you know, just tasting all of them and taking notes. Like this one could use a little bit more cinnamon or this one is a little too dry. I'd like a little bit more moisture. I'd like, anyways, this is really boring, like food tech talk. I don't think it's um, boring. I think it's <laughs> why you've created this empire is that people are so interested in food and ways to make it new and fresh. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the recipes, but it's really the visuals of your food that are so eye-catching. So how do those come to you? Are you just like laying in bed and you're like, yes, more marshmallows on the face? Or like, how do these ideas come to you? It's exactly like that. Uh, some people talk about like creative people or talent. They talk about sometimes experiencing 
you know, creative blocks or writer blocks. I have never had one of those. I have the opposite problem where it's still a problem, but my brain just doesn't shut off. Like morning, noon, or night, I'll be laying in bed and just get food ideas, or I'm in the shower and I'm like, oh, what if we did this? Uh, so my team is so patient and wonderful, but it's just constant energy, creativity, and ideas where I have a problem shutting the creativity off. So there's never an issue with coming up with the ideas. It's more just time to execute all of the things that I want to create. If you're a scientist and your lab is your home, because what I didn't realize is that you shot a lot of the images for the book in your home you create everything yes, in your home. all of them yeah. yeah so what is that like having your workspace just downstairs you can just go do you go like any time of the night and you're like yeah I want to try this out yeah it's kind of perfect for me because I love working from home because I'm getting all these ideas all types of day and I can always then just pop into the kitchen and test them out so for me I love working from home and it's just I'm always creative and I'm always in that space and it's just it is, it's wonderful, because I live in L.A. too, and, you know, commuting is, is terrible. The traffic's terrible. So when your home office is right downstairs, there's no commute, and I could just jump right in there and start on a new idea. I love that so much. So let's talk about the book a little more, too. Your family is a constant theme throughout it, um, which I think as a reader endears me even more to you, and the recipes are so much more personal. So what was the thought process behind making sure that your mom and your dad and your sister were in the book? They are, they're my everything. Every memory that I have around a holiday or a special event in my life is because of my parents and my family. And my sister works with me full time and my parents live with me half the year. So we just spend so much time together. And so when I was making recipes that were celebrating these different holidays and these different occasions, it just wouldn't be right. It just wouldn't be the same without them. So this is the first time that I really featured them and incorporated them more in a literary form, like in a book. And this book is just, it's even more special than the first book because it's more personal. I'm a baker, so I don't really do a lot of like story time vlogs where I kind of like talk about what's going on in my life. I usually just do baking tutorials. So this is the first time that I actually got to open up kind of more about special memories in my life or special people in my life. And um, sorry, I'm getting a little bit emotional, but I dedicated the book to my mom and dad and I surprised them and they just started crying and sending me pictures and that was just such a wonderful moment. Um, they knew that they would be in the book because there's a chapter for Mother's Day recipes, a chapter for Father's Day recipes. Oh my gosh, there's Papa Pete. This, this is photo of one of my dad. favorite photos in the entire book. This I is mean, look, look at this mustache. He's like throwing up pizza dough. It's an epic mustache. He has had that. He looks iconic. Forever. He's had that since I think he said the seventh grade. So I've never seen my dad without this mustache. Uh, that's Papa Pizza. That's his nickname. And that's what he is in my phone. I call him Papa Pizza since I was a little kid. And he's really good at making pizzas. So it was very fitting. But he taught me how to do a pizza flip, a pizza dough flip when I was little. And we didn't have a lot of money growing up. And that's why also food is so special to me is we didn't have a lot of money growing up, so how we express love to each other is we would cook something or bake something for each other, you know, on a special day. Because um, some gifts can get really expensive, but we were always able to afford sugar, flour, and eggs because they're relatively inexpensive. And so you can always whip together a little something and customize it. Uh, I remember one year for my birthday, my mom... I think, I, I think money was really tight that year, but she made me a homemade, really simple cake, and she just piped. It was a really ugly. <laughs> it was made with love, so it's all right. She's not a decorator. She's a great baker, but not, not a decorator. But she just piped an R on it for my birthday. And it was just this cute little monogram, simple, ugly cake. But she made it with love, and she made it from scratch, and it just... It was the best. It was, it was the best. So and she made it for you. You know, that yeah. was yours. And that's so sweet. Yeah. So um, I made a whole bunch of recipes like that. There's a few family recipes. One of my favorite, blackberry cobbler. <gasps> so good. I grew up in Seattle and there was wild blackberries everywhere. So it's the one fruit or berry that you could get for free. You never needed to go to the grocery store and buy 
blackberries. They were at the bus stop. They were these huge weeds that would just overgrow your yard. They were at uh, public parks. They were everywhere. So we used to take baskets or buckets, and we used to just go blackberry picking, and we'd make jams, and we'd make this delicious blackberry cobbler recipe, which is in the book. And I made it for my dad's birthday this year. And there's a lot of special recipes in there like that. And I, it feels I love really that cool. This has been a part of you since your childhood. Like, you know, it's, that's why I think it feels so authentic and amazing is that this has like been ingrained in you from the beginning. Um, if you are unfamiliar with some of her creations, I pulled out some from the Halloween chapter because <gasps> Halloween is just around the corner. My favorite holiday. My favorite holiday. And these wowed me. So the first one is Frankenstein. Okay? <gasps> oh Guys, my gosh. These Come are on. so good. You almost good. don't even want to eat them because they're so cute. I just made this recipe with my sister the other day on YouTube. Mint chocolate chip Rice Krispie treats. My mom growing up would always make Rice Krispie treats. And she would do this like if the cereal maybe was getting a little stale. But she still didn't want to be wasteful and she still wanted to use it. So she would mix it up with melted marshmallows and make these treats and then they taste phenomenal. So. And I have to say, I was at first intimidated because I like, I want to make these, but it looks Hard. I watched your video with your <gasps> sister. You did. Okay. And I was like, I think I can handle this. They're pretty simple. Yeah. They look more detailed than they, well, these ones I like perfectly place them, but when you're making them in a hurry, you can just dip them and stick stuff on there and they're just as cute and they're almost cuter when they're a little messier, yeah. in my opinion. And I like you can change their faces too. Yeah. Oh, their expression. <laughs> they're all a little concerned, except for him. Maybe he knows Bad. that he's like, oh no. He knows you're going to eat him. Knows it. Yeah. <laughs> the next one we had that I thought was really cute were the bats. Oh, my goodness. I love bats. So what's inside of these bats? Delicious. It's a caramel chocolate peanut butter truffle. Okay. So a lot of people see these and they think it's a cake bot. Truffles are really easy to make, just like a rolled chocolate. It, it sounds so fancy and it tastes so good, <laughs> but they're really simple. And then we just dunk them in a little bit of dark chocolate. And the wings, you actually pipe these onto a piece of wax paper, get a little piping bag and just pipe them and let them set. Let them the cool, cool places are you have the on. templates in the back of the book, right? Because mm -hmm. at first I saw those, I'm like, well, how do you make those wings perfectly? But you have the shapes in the back of the book. Yeah. And people just have to trace them. So you've done all the hard work for yeah. them, basically. Yeah, we have all the templates in the back of the book. So if you don't want to freehand, which I don't always love freehanding. You never know what's going to happen. But every bat's different, so you could. But <laughs> it just helps. It's like a guide. Yeah. And you can just trace right over it. You, like, print out the template put a piece of wax paper on top and then pipe on top of it, like tracing paper. For me Edible. in the beginning, mm. the, as a beginner, that was really helpful that you had the templates in there and you have conversion tables in the back of the book too, mm -hmm. just in case people get confused. There's terminology. Yes. And I just love, why was it important for you to make sure it's just broken down to the most basic level? For I people? really wanted to break it down, especially the terminology, because a lot of times when I was reading a recipe growing up and I was a beginner baker, they would use words like fold, your chocolate chips in gently. And I'm like, what, what the heck is a fold? They just mix it in there? Like, what are you talking about? So I thought it was really important just to like highlight those different terms that a lot of bakers use. Cause they're really easy, they're really simple. And then I took a picture of each term. So to kind of give a visual aid of how easy it is. It's just, they use different terms. It's lear learning a whole new language. So the, yeah. the images really helped me personally. Uh, the last one we have are little corn, um, <gasps> this one's more of a general fall so dessert. So good. This is a peanut butter cookie. <laughs> I, I don't know if you love peanut. I could talk about food I all day. I love peanut butter. But this is a delicious peanut butter cookie recipe. And then we've just cut them into be these cute little like corn husks. But this homemade, fr this is a honey buttercream frosting. I ate so many of these. This, the, oh, that frosting at the end is so good. And then we just took those little, you know, Reese's uh, peanut butter. So it would be like a matching, like, you know, uh, palette. And it's also really fun. We, I have a huge family on my Italian side, bunch of little cousins and stuff. And I always try to think of things, some that are just really basic, and then some that, that would be fun to decorate together as a family. Because one of my favorite things is, to be honest, is have a glass of wine, decorate some cookies, and like watch a movie. That sounds um, like the perfect Friday night. <laughs> I just find that really relaxing, and for me, that's how I de-stress. So this is one of those things where, you know, you're just placing on little candies, and it just is like stress relieving, and also I can, you know, snack while I'm doing it. Can you imagine, though, walking into Thanksgiving, like, I've just prepared this. 
No big deal. Like you really, it's, it's fun because you allow people to make statements, you know, and mm-hmm. it's so hard, I think, to think of a dish to bring to a holiday and you just kind of laid it out and everything is so beautiful. It kind of gives you the confidence to try it, you know? Every recipe is delicious. There's no bogeys in this book. So if you need a great, you know, like a fall time recipe or a holiday recipe, Valentine's Day, anything, every recipe is good. So you don't have to worry about showing up to an event or a party or a get together or having dinner and someone's like, Ooh, thanks for cooking tonight. And you're like, it's like Brittany brought store bought cookies again. It's like, <laughs> no longer. Um, oh. Speaking of cookies, your puppy cookie is here with you today. <gasps> so cute. This is her first time to New York. She's so cute. And I recently watched a video where you were trying to pick her Halloween costume. It's a very stressful time of year for some people. You got to pick the right costume. Yes, yes. We had to take a poll. You had your viewers vote. I personally vote for the lumberjack. I thought she was just so cute in that. That was the funniest. Did you decide yet or are you still? Well, the most votes that we've tallied have been for the French toast costume. But it's pretty close with also that little pumpkin hoodie. So I re- it's up in the air right now. It's pretty close between those two. Okay. The pumpkin ho- hoodie, though, she could just wear on like a casual yeah. day in the fall. Halloween Eve. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Just out, out to brunch. Just be a little jack-o'-lantern. <laughs> she was so adorable in New York. This is the first time she's ever flown with me or traveled with me. And she has, I think she she's loving it. She went to Central Park for the first time. She met other little dogs and she met her first horse. <laughs> she just looked and... Wanted to smell it. She was like, what is this? I've never seen this being before. It was so cute. So you have 10 million subscribers. (laughs) See, I'm blushing again. On YouTube, (laughs) which is just insane. I mean, it is such a devoted uh, audience to you. So, you know, when you look at that number, and I know that when you started out, that was not your intention, really. You were just trying to get comfortable in front of the camera and just Mm -hmm. sort of have fun. And it really grew into this big thing. So do you process that? how big it's become? I don't often sit back and think about it because of that kind of like hyper creative mindset that I'm always in. I'm always living in the moment or kind of thinking a couple steps ahead, like creativity wise. It's not often where I sit still and sit back and kind of look at things. And when I do, I get a little embarrassed um, and blush and just, cause it's just such a huge number. It just doesn't seem real. It's the best word that I could explain it is just surreal. Because it just, I don't even know what that number looks like. The, and that wasn't my intention when I started. I was trying to have fun, get more comfortable in front of the camera. And also when I started, YouTube was such a different place. It was just a really cool free video hosting site. And why that was so cool, Okay, this is just going to take a second, I promise, but I really love food bloggers. Um, When I was growing up and I was going to school, I would get on the internet, and I was like, and I could read blogs of these foodies who would go to restaurants, take pictures, and they would write their food reviews, like food critics, and I thought, how cool is this? This is an everyday person who's a food critic, and they're taking pictures, and they're telling me what their favorites are, so it really helped when I grew up in Seattle. I was reading all these food blogs, and like, what restaurants should I go to? Which new foods should I check out? And then when YouTube came out, I thought, how cool. Maybe you could do this in video form. That's what I was kind of thinking originally. Uh, But to host videos on your own website is so expensive. It is astronomical. And when I looked at those costs of having my own website and hosting my own videos, not possible. For someone who, you know, didn't have a business partner and didn't have any backing, it just financially wasn't possible. So YouTube was just this cool place, free video hosting. And I thought, how cool, let's play around on here. And now it has grown into this huge, massive social media and entertainment platform. And I had no idea that it would grow into this amazing community, amazing space, the platform it is today. And I, I love it. How has Instagram changed or built upon what you do? Because it's such a, you know, especially for food, it's such Mm -hmm. a destination for people. So how has that kind of changed your your process? It's just another place where I connect and share what I love and connect with other people who love what I love. So it's just a different kind of 
form of it, where YouTube, I really just focus on video content, like short form video content. Some of my videos are getting longer and longer, and um, let me know if they ever get too long, um, because we, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, she's like, uh, 15 minutes, Ro, it's just too long. But yeah, I'm so sorry, I'm so, see, let me know these things, it really helps, but We've been getting a lot more, my team's been getting a lot more feedback that people would like to get to know me more. So instead of just a straightforward tutorial like, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, they're like, tell me about your day or like, what's going on? I'm like, oh, okay. So the videos have kind of naturally started to get a little longer and longer and they feel more episodic. And really YouTube is kind of my platform for that space and to connect with people that way. And Instagram is different because it's connecting with people um, more with the, like stationary video and in comments. And also with stories, it's kind of taking people along on my instant journey, which is really neat because it's the closest thing that I do to vlogging. Because on YouTube, I've never really vlogged. So Instagram is, the Instagram stories is kind of my, my vlogging. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's how they People get different. to know you even more. Different. Yeah, I really love it. It's just so fun and casual. And we've been getting more requests to vlog, and I was like, okay, that's new, because that no one wanted, was interested in seeing that before. And and I'm flattered and embarrassed that people <laughs> would want to see that now. So well, People are definitely interested, and I know we have some people in the audience. So let's go to questions before we get out of here. Who do we have first? Yes, question. Hey, Ro. Um, what was the hardest recipe to create? The hardest recipe to create in this book? In, or just in general? In general. The hardest recipe to cook is, oh, always hands down, it's the finickiest cookie in the world. I've, I've mentioned this before, but the French macaron cookie with those little feet, it's just the most finicky cookie. So for any beginner baker out there, or even an experienced intermediate baker, if you're trying to make that cookie, give yourself a break. It's tough, and it's always tough. And, and even now today, someone who's baking like 70 hours a week, I still mess it up. You know, the, the eggs have to be at room temperature, and even the heat from your hand when you're piping them. If your heat from your hand is too hot, the batter changes consistency, and they come out too flat. So it, that's how finicky it is. You got to work quick. Um, so still today, the French macaron. <laughs> Yeah. If you mess it up, I know a nice bakery down the street. Yeah. And you just go buy a dozen. I'm joking. Love. Next. Oh, go ahead. Questions? Yes. Hello. I love Hi. your shirt. Thank you. My question is, I love baking, and I want to start my own YouTube channel. Yes. What's some tips you could give me to start off? Just get started. Don't worry about being perfect. Uh, a lot of my friends who are thinking about starting YouTube channels, they want to wait until they have the perfect show, they have the perfect videos, they have the perfect equipment, they have the perfect like set or setting to make videos, and they kind of put it off until they feel like it's perfect. And I would say, jump in and don't be afraid to make mistakes. When I started my YouTube channel, I started making videos on the worst camera out there. I think it was the most inexpensive camera out there. It was those little flip cameras that they don't even make anymore. It was an $80 camera from Target. I had the worst lighting, no lighting. Um, I didn't really know how to be on camera. I was so nervous that I wasn't even smiling half the time. If you watch my beginning videos, I'm just like, and today we're, and then I'm putting this on because I was afraid to just be goofy and be myself and just know that that's okay. And the more that you do it, like the more that you're on camera and the more that you're doing stuff, the more that you're on camera, the more that you're making videos, the more that you're baking, you're gonna get naturally better and better and better and better. So don't be afraid that you need to be perfect right away. Like you, you can grow into it. And I really love that saying that the more you do something, the better you be, practice makes perfect. Yeah, not perfect, but you know, it, like you just, you can't help but get better when you're doing something for hours and hours. Thank you. I hope that that's helpful. And, and I also want to say the more bakers and more food channels, the better. I also get asked a lot of times, like, do you want there to be more bakers? Is that competition? I'm like, no, it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. I love food. I want more food channels. I don't think that there's enough. And I think that the more bakers you have out there, that's just more teachers. 
for to teach people about how to prepare their own food, how to get creative with food. I love it. And also, the food community is so nice. Like, the other foodies, the other bakers are seriously, they're the nicest people. So come join. Yeah. Are you going to do it? Yes. Yes. Good luck. Next question. Hi. Um, one, big fan. Uh, two, uh, the first video I watched of yours was one with Kurt, which just <gasps> made me love you even more because oh my I gosh, love both of you. <laughs> that is so sweet. He is seriously one of the nicest people <laughs> in the world. I love Kurt. Um, and my question: uh, What's your favorite thing to bake when you're not filming? My favorite thing to bake when I'm not filming would be, it was kind of an accident. I'm sorry, I'll keep this short, but I could talk about food seriously all day, was I was out with my girlfriends. We were out late. I got in late, and I was craving some just, like, fudgy brownies. I really wanted brownies, and we didn't have any butter left in the fridge. So I was thinking to myself, late-night thoughts, what do I do here? And I was like, I have an avocado tree in the back. So I ran out there, picked an avocado, I mashed it up, and my mindset is going, well, I need a fat. That's how it's going to taste creamy and delicious. And avocados, you know, have those natural fats. I think that this could replace the butter. That I think that this will work. And I baked it, and it was so good. It was so delicious. And it was a happy accident. And now that is something that I just love to bake when I'm not filming, when I'm craving chocolate, which is pretty often. So it's basically avocado brownies. Long story short. I'm kind of in shock. You can replace butter with avocado. Right? I Googled it afterwards. It's a thing. Because it was um, a very fun night out. <laughs> so <laughs> Say no more. Say no more. It was a great time. Um, so I Googled it afterwards. And yeah, I guess the food science does work out. I love that. Yeah. The more you know. Ed, one last question before we go. Question. Hi. This question's from my sister. What inspired you to become a baker? That's a great question. I... Never really, I guess, intended to be a baker. Baking's just something that I've always done as a hobby. Growing up, I loved baking with the family. I loved singing. I loved dancing. I loved acting, hanging out with my friends. I loved animals. All of these things that I loved. And it's just kind of what naturally happened when I was making videos for fun. It just kind of naturally what evolved. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I hope, I hope that's okay. And it answer. worked out. <laughs> because now you have your second cookbook that is available in stores now. So you guys can go pick up baking all year round wherever books are sold. Please give it up for Rosanna Pensino. Thank you so Thank much you. for having me.